Native American Voices with Louis Cook and Ray Fadden is brought to you by the Akwazasne Gahwajile Genealogy and Historical Society with funding provided by Onoe and Plenty International. We invite you to listen to the complete series online at www.gahwajile.org. Nyawa jizawa dahunsade. This is Native American Voices. Greetings. We hope that things are well with you. I'm Louis Cook. Welcome to this program about the native peoples of the Americas. So often, history is written as the white man documented and recorded it. In native cultures, condolence canes, pictographs, and beaded record belts provide a basis to preserve the oral tradition and the Indian people's view of their history. Over 50 years ago, Mohawk elder Diana Thonu, Ray Fadden, began collecting these materials and putting into print the oral tradition which had never been written down. Ray Fadden has spent a lifetime studying Native American history in order to explain the overall significance of Indian culture to the foundations of modern society. When he retired from teaching in the public school system after 35 years, Ray and his wife Christine founded the Six Nations Museum next to their home in the Adirondack Mountains. Here, there is always a welcome greeting for their Native American friends and the tourists who stop by the museum to hear Ray's entertaining and educational lectures. In this program from the Six Nations Museum, Ray Fadden reads a beaded record belt to recount the history of the Iroquoian peoples from their establishment in the eastern woodlands to a period after the American Revolutionary War. You are invited to stay with us to hear Diana Thonu on Native American Voices. Archaeological evidence and carbon dating have established that Iroquoian peoples have lived in and around what is now New York State for 700 years or more. In language, custom, and societal organization, they have much in common with native peoples who once lived to the south. Their strong agricultural base and religious traditions also provide a link with Indian peoples who inhabited Mesoamerica and the southwest. The oral tradition of the Iroquois talks about a migration. In all likelihood, the Iroquois emigrated from Mesoamerica and gradually established themselves along the Great Lakes. Over time, they became the strongest culture in the area. Their skills in farming, hunting, military tactics, and political organization were primarily responsible for Iroquoian success. They controlled the fur trade in North America, and their influence extended as far west as the plains and as far south as Appalachia. From a beaded record belt at the Six Nations Museum, Ray Fadden talks about the history of the Iroquoian peoples and their long journey to a homeland in the Northeast. Now, as far back as the old people remember their fathers telling them, as far back as tradition goes, they say their villages were far toward the setting sun. They say they lived beside a great river where there were grassy plains, where there were buffalo. They say they were friends and brothers of the wolf people, the Pawnees, that they lived near each other in friendship. Now today, the Pawnees of way out west in Oklahoma, they also say their fathers told them that long ago, they and the Iroquois lived near each other in friendship. Many miles separate the Pawnee from the Iroquois today. 
yet they both had the same tradition of living near each other once, long ago. So it must be true. We know the Pawnees came from the south, Mexico. It's possible the Iroquois may have come with them. To the west were the great mountains, where the rivers Missouri, Mississippi, and especially the Ohio hit the Mississippi and went to the sea. That's where the Iroquois were, according to their own traditions, long, long ago. Beyond that's forgotten. In fact, Ohio is an Iroquois word, only they, as usual, they don't pronounce it right. It's Ohio, Ohio, means nice river, beautiful river. Northeast was the Great Lakes. No one knows why, but for some reason, the Iroquois packed their goods on their backs. Many footsteps led toward the rising sun. Their moccasins headed east up the Ohio toward the Great Lakes. Now, when we think of the Iroquois, we think of those six people we studied in seventh grade social studies. Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, Tuscarora. There were other people who were related to the Iroquois. One band went south, through Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, up over the Appalachian Mountains. They found a beautiful mountain valley country now called North Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee. They liked it. They stayed there. They were known as the Cherokees. Those are distant cousins. One band settled right about here. They were called Oyunkongorun tobacco people because they made their living raising tobacco and trading it. Up here near Georgian Bay, the Wyandots or the Hurons settled. Near Lake Erie, the Erie Karuna built their towns. Lake Erie is named after them. Near the Niagara frontier, the Neuter Indians lived. Just south of them, the Wendrow people migrated. Down along the Susquehanna River, the Susquehannocks or Andastes migrated. Some call them Ganastogas. Probably that's where they got the name for that wagon, Ganastoga wagon from that Indian word. And two smaller Iroquoian people, Maharan, Nataway, continue south into what's now Virginia. Now, all of those people I mentioned were related. All Iroquoian people had the same common origin, tradition, custom, language, and ways. Iroquois refer to those people as Ungwe people, Ungwe, Ungwe people. The main band continued on up the St. Lawrence River. They traveled through a forest region. Now, they met a people who were different than they were. They spoke a different language, they had different customs, different ways. They were smaller people than the Iroquois, but there were many of them, many more of them than they were Iroquois. They were hunters, while the Iroquois were more or less farmers. At first, the Iroquois got along okay with those people, but after a while, bad feelings came up, mainly because the Iroquois proved to be better hunters. And the Iroquois noticed when these people cooked their food, especially when hunting was poor, they fell back on the inner bark of certain trees. Certain kind of trees give you nourishment, the bark, inner bark. And these people had great knowledge of this. So the Iroquois, in slang, like a nickname, they call those people Anunduk sometimes, Adelunduk, means bark eater, porcupine. Many battles were fought between the Adelunduk and the Iroquois. Many were killed, and in the end, the Iroquois were conquered. In that ancient day, they weren't as strong as they were to be later on. For many winters or years, the Iroquois were forced to pay tribute skins and meat to the Adiludak who had the power. Their hearts were bitter. They prayed for freedom to the eagle. Children, women, men asked Zakuyatizo, our creator, God, said somehow they could get away. They say they were in this condition for many years. Generations passed. But all of that time, the Iroquois planned on getting away to another place. And one dark night, while the Adiludak were away to the north on a hunting trip, the Iroquois got in their canoes with their families Silently they paddled away, hoping the Adelunduk wouldn't find out which way they went. Up the St. Lawrence River, round the Thousand Islands, right where that river Oswego enters what the white men call Lake Ontario. Now that's an Indian word too, but it isn't pronounced right. Scandatario, Ontario, Scandatario, means a nice lake, a pleasant lake. They were overtaken near the mouth of the Oswego, and a battle took place. Lucky for the Iroquois, a great storm came up. In the confusion, high winds, rough waters, Iroquois got away. Adirundak returned home. They erected their villages along the Oswego. <laughs> Long ago, the nations of the Iroquois abandoned warfare and united in a pact of peace and friendship called the Law of the Great Peace. Known to the French as the Iroquois Confederacy and to the English as the Six Nations Confederacy, they called themselves the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Long House, because of the shape of their communal home. 
Archaeological evidence reveals some surprising facts about the lifestyle. Ray Fadden explains. Now, the Iroquois didn't live in those teepee-like tents you see in moving pictures. That kind of a house, a teepee, belongs way out west on the Great Plains with that big feather headdress. The Iroquois lived in long bark houses, and they were good-sized buildings, a lot larger than people realize. Several years ago, at a place called Onondaga Hill near Syracuse, archaeologists discovered a village site they never knew existed. And because the ground wasn't disturbed too much, they were able to trace where the bark houses were. The busts of the posts are still in the earth, but so ancient they crumble into dust. In fact, they carbon dated that village site, and they figured they were living there way back in 1300 and something. Now, one of those archaeologists visited this place, and he gave me a picture of part of the excavation. But to give you an idea of the size of some of the bark houses, I was surprised myself. I knew they were long, but I never realized how big some of them were. 336 feet long. That's a good-sized building. Of course, one family didn't live in it. It was partitioned off like an apartment house. I imagine a clan may have lived there. And a few years later, at a place near Casanova in New York, they uncovered another village site, and one of the bark houses was twice as long as that. Do you see why one of the names, the Iroquois, called themselves Haudenosaunee, longhouse people? because of the kind of houses they lived in a long time ago. Well, they found good hunting along the Oswego. They found rich soil for corn, bean, and squash. For many years, their bark houses, their fires were beside this river. In time, they multiplied. Many men, women, and children. So many mouths to feed, game became scarce. So different bands left looking for new hunting grounds. They went in six different directions. One band settled along the Mohawk River. They called themselves Kamiakahaga, people of Flint. White people call them Mohawks. Where Oneida Lake is, another band settled. They call themselves Ganutwehas, people of Standing Stone. White men call them Oneidas. Down there were Syracuse, the Onondaga Roon, the people of the hills, and the Onondaga settled. Out near Cayuga Lake, the Guyun Guyun, the people of the Great Swamp. Or Cayugas built their towns. And way out near Canandaigua Lake, another band settled. They call themselves Nundawaun, the people of the Great Mountain. White men call them Senecas. One band went far south along the coast, way down to what is now North Carolina. They settled on the Neuse, the Pamlico, the Tor Rivers, and they called themselves Ago Tuscarora, shirt-wearing people. White men called them Tuscaroras. For many years, the Tuscaroras lived along these three rivers. After a while, the white men came. Like all natural people, I hate that word primitive. Sounds like you're not developed yet. Natural people is a better word. Like all natural people, hospitable people, trusting people, honest people. They welcomed these strangers in with open arms. Remember when you watch those cowboy and Indian stories at night on TV about those bad Indians? The Indians always welcomed those early explorers when they first came here. The Indians were willing to share their land with them. And like other Indians, the Tuscaroras gave these strangers land to plant corn on for their women and children. Gave them many, many agricultural food plants unknown across the ocean taught those early settlers how to live in this land, America. And when those settlers were hungry, and they were hungry many times, and their little ones cried for bread, it was the Tuscaroras who gave them meat, corn, and fish. But what happened to other Indians also happened to the Tuscaroras. When these strangers became numerous, they became bold. And when they became very numerous and outnumbered the Tuscaroras 50 to 1, they became very, very bold and they seized the land of the Tuscaroras, claiming it was theirs, by right of a grant from their generous king across the ocean 3,000 miles away. Very big-hearted of him. That wasn't bad enough. They also seized the Tuscaroras and sold them into slavery. Of course they fought back, as any brave people would do. But in the way that many Indians, unfortunately, were tricked in those days, so the Tuscaroras were tricked. They were asked to attend a peace conference at a place called New Bern in North Carolina. That place still exists. They waited till they had gathered most of them in the town square, surrounded them, kidnapped them, shipped them away as slaves to the West Indies. Their Iroquois kinsmen went down and rescued the remnant of them. The Oneida Indians gave them land in what's now New York State, near where Unadilla, Shenanga River, Susquehanna, flows into Susquehanna River, northwest of Binghamton, New York. And for a while, the Tuscaroras lived with their sponsors, the Oneidas. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
No colonial government, whether Dutch, English, or French, could ever ignore the Iroquois. Their warriors were said to be invincible, and their geographic location made them masters of the important waterways to the north and to the west. Clearly, they could be valuable allies and formidable enemies. For 100 years, the Iroquois were profoundly involved in rivalries between the French and the English. The League of the Iroquois proved to be the mainstay against French penetration south of the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes region. It was this resistance that ended the hopes for a new France in North America. When the English took over the colony of New Netherlands from the Dutch, they also inherited the friendly relations the Dutch had maintained with the Iroquois. Through diplomatic tactics of trade and religion, the British forged a long-term alliance with the Iroquois which lasted until the American Revolutionary War. When the American colonies split from Great Britain, a rivalry ensued to win the favor of the Iroquois. Unfortunately for the Iroquois, one of the paths to conquest lay through the lands called home, and neither the Americans nor the British could ignore the strategic importance of the Iroquois country. The Presbyterian missionary Samuel Kirkland was one of the most effective agents for the Americans, influencing the Oneida and Tuscarora peoples. On the other front, Sir William Johnson used every theological and political argument available to bring the Oneidas into alliance with the British. To the Iroquois, the American Revolutionary War was an unnatural conflict among their white brothers. The peace chiefs of the Iroquois Confederacy resolved to remain neutral while the father and son were fighting, although it became almost impossible to do so. Severe pressures came to be placed on the Iroquois League of Peace by their warring white neighbors. With the British and the Americans actively recruiting, many of the Iroquois warriors found themselves fighting their kinsmen in their own territories. For example, while many of the Mohawks fought for the British under the leadership of the Mohawk British Colonel Joseph Brand, many other Mohawks fought for the Americans. The Tuscarora and Oneida warriors fought on the side of the Americans, as you will hear while Ray Fadden recounts some little-known facts about the American Revolutionary War. After a while, along comes the American Revolutionary War. Contrary to what that school book teaches children about all of the Indians fighting for Great Britain during the Revolutionary War, just as many Indians fought for the Americans during that Revolutionary War, and among them were the Oneidas and the Tuscaroras. Their villages were burned to the ground by the enemy. They lost many of their warriors fighting for this country. As a matter of fact, the farthest north outpost fort, north of the Mohawk Valley, during the Revolutionary War, at Palmer's Falls in the upper Hudson River, not too far from here, was entirely garrisoned by Oneida and Tuscarora Indians. General Washington's personal cook was an Oneida Indian woman. I've had right in my hand the shawl that the Continental Congress voted for Martha Washington to take that Indian woman to Philadelphia to buy her a present in appreciation of her services during the war. After she had refused the pension, saying it was her patriotic duty, the Oneida still owned that shawl, sent a safety ball to Syracuse. General Washington's personal bodyguard was an Indian, not an Iroquois, but an Indian. General Lafayette's personal bodyguard was Nicholas Cusick, a Tuscarora Indian, and his warriors. And you remember Valley Forge when Washington was having a tough time? He had no money, no food, no clothing. He turned and asked his own people for help. What their reply was? You won't find it in that school book. I did a little research. It was what it would probably still be today. Do you have any money? Washington got no help down there when he, what he took by force. In fact, the settlers at Valley Forge furnished the British with supplies because they did have money. But what that school book never told children is this. On their backs in the middle of the winter, and if you remember Valley Forge, it was a very severe winter, the Oneida and Tuscarora Indians traveled on snowshoe all the way from Oneida lands, clean down to Valley Forge, with 600 bushels of corn on their backs, and helped keep Washington's hungry army through the winter. They asked nothing in return. In that Indian way, that natural way, they did it out of friendship. And Washington and the Continental Congress said these words to the Oneidas and Tuscaroras, our faithful, loyal brothers, Indian brothers, Though you had nothing to gain, you fought for our cause, even against your own kinsmen. 
Your villages were burned to the ground. You have made great sacrifices in proof of your friendship and loyalty to us. Never will we allow anyone to dispossess you and your territories ever because our hearts are full of gratefulness and our memory is long. Those were the words said to the United Tuscaroras. Unfortunately, their memory was short. Nineteen years afterwards, that little time, white settlers began pushing into Indian lands, even the United Tuscaroras shoving them out. Even though the leaders of these settlers had vast tracts of thousands of acres of land they weren't even using, but in that peculiar European way, very different from old Indian way, their leaders never shared equally with their people as Indian leaders did. Those vast tracts of land were owned by special privileged families, the Schuylers, the Clintons, the Stuyvesants, the Rensselaers, yes, even the Jeffersons and Washingtons, who had secured those vast tracts of land in the form of grants from their generous king across the ocean, or from the Indians for nothing or for a song, and they wouldn't part with one acre of that land, only for a price. Most of their people were poor. They didn't have that price. So what did they do? They crowded into the Indian lands. They were encouraged to. And when the Uniteds and Tuscaroos protested, they were laughed at. They lost their unit of Shenango lands. The Seneca Indians of Western New York State, not far from Niagara Falls, gave the Tuscaroos a piece of land where they live today called Tuscaro Reservation. And believe me, they're having a difficult time hanging on to those few acres of land for their grandchildren. I know. I lived there three years. Now that's the Mohawk traditional story of how the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and later the Tuscaroos what Englishmen call five or six nations, French call Iroquois, Dutch call Mingo, Swedes call Makwa, they call themselves Ngahuwe, how they came here long ago. Ray Fadden, Diana Tonlu, Mohawk elder and educator at the Six Nations Museum near Anchiota, New York, talking about the history, culture, and philosophy of the people of the Longhouse, the Iroquois. You've been listening to Native American Voices, which is produced in the studios of North Country Public Radio, WSLU-FM, at the St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York. Our series of talks and stories from the Six Nations Museum was produced with a grant from the New York Council for the Humanities. Recordings were done at the Six Nations Museum in Anchiota, New York, by WSLU engineer Joshua Sacco. The song, Color Nature Gone, was written and performed by the American Indian rock group Exit and appears on their album Silent Warrior. The associate producer of this series is Peggy Berryhill. I'm Louis Cook, your host and producer, inviting you to join us again next time. Until then, I say, Skano, peace. Native American Voices with Louis Cook and Ray Fadden is brought to you by the Akwazasne Gahwajile Genealogy and Historical Society with funding provided by Onoe and Plenty International. We invite you to listen to the complete series online at www.gahwajile.org. Nyawa jizawadahunsadeh.